There's a very special member in China's lineup of rockets called the Long March 2F, a launch vehicle that's had the task of sending every Chinese astronaut to space since 2003. And this rocket has a fascinating history. Nicknamed Shenjian, meaning Divine Arrow, it was derived from a rocket that was initially never meant to see the day, and today it is a key component of China's crewed space program. As always, let's get into the nitty-gritty details of this story. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Let's start with some historical context. In the early 1980s, the Chinese space program was clearly less advanced than those of Western powers and the USSR. And the US, for example, was at the time putting into service the space shuttle. Nevertheless, China had some more modest but still noteworthy achievements that it could boast about. It had launched its first satellite in 1970, the Dongfang Hong 1, becoming the fifth country to ever do so, and had also developed a series of small to medium lift launch vehicles, the Long March 1 and the Long March 2. It had started a program of recoverable satellites, the FSW, and perhaps more importantly, the country had big ambitions for larger rockets and more powerful telecommunications and Earth observation satellites. The 1980s also marked China's entry into the era of economic reforms, also known as Gaiga Kaifeng, after two decades of turmoil and political instability under the previous Chinese leadership. And this period of reform would see very significant economic growth and in-depth reforms of state-owned enterprises, which composed at the time the overwhelming majority of China's economy. Many of these state-owned enterprises were considered to be overstaffed, oversized, and inefficient, and reforms including massive cuts in subsidies were made to oblige them to become self-sufficient and generate revenue. And this naturally applied to China's space industry. So how is any of this related to the Long March 2F? Well, it's in this context that the baseline rocket, which would later be derived into the Long March 2F, was developed. In the mid-late 1970s, China had started developing its first series of medium lift rockets, the Long March 2 series. The Long March 2 is a two-stage rocket derived from the Dongfeng 5 ballistic missile, and it was launched for the first time in 1974 and resulted in failure. After this first drawback, the rocket was slightly modified into a Long March 2A, which would launch successfully and be in surface between 1975 and 1979. After that, an improved, longer, and more powerful version was designed and launched in 1982, and this would be the Long March 2C. The Long March 2C rapidly became one of China's main workhorses for launches into LEO, with the rocket still being in service today, and having been launched roughly 60 times over the past 40 years, and also having gone through incremental improvements over the years to adapt to various payloads. So we're in 1982. China now had a reliable rocket for low Earth orbit, the Long March 2C, but it wanted to develop a geostationary satellite and naturally a rocket able to put such a payload into geostationary transfer orbit, also known as GTO. And this will lead to two GTO capable rockets, the Long March 3 and the Long March 2E. The first rocket, the Long March 3, despite having a bigger number in its name, was a rather modest launch vehicle able to put 1.5 tons into GTO. In the early 1980s, after multiple trial and error efforts, the Chinese overcame the challenges of this rocket, including designing their very first cryogenic upper stage, and the rocket was operational starting from 1984 onwards. Now, for the second rocket, the Long March 2E, this is where it gets interesting. This was a rocket that wasn't on the initial roadmap. It was never supposed to see the day. Launch into GTO was supposed to be managed by the Long March 3 and its derivatives. And yet in the late 1980s and early 1990s, in the context of the economic reforms that I mentioned previously, and also an unprecedented push from China to try and capture some of the international commercial launch contracts, China decided to develop a larger, initially unplanned rocket over a period of 18 months. And this is the Long March 2E. This rocket was an elongated version of the Long March 2C with the addition of four strap-on boosters and also a solid perigee kick motor, which would greatly enhance the capabilities of the rocket and enable it to put roughly 3.5 tons into GTO. 
The rocket entered service in 1990, but would not have a good career. After multiple failures and a questionable reliability, it was then withdrawn and replaced by the Long March 3A and 3B in 1995. And while the Long March 2E is definitely not in the Hall of Fame of Great Rockets, it had an unexpected offspring, which is, you've guessed it, the Long March 2F. In parallel to all the bustling activity around developing geostationary satellites in the 80s and 90s, China also decided to launch its own crewed spaceflight program in 1992. This would be called the Project 921, named after the year and the month the project was validated. The project aimed at giving China an independent capability of launching astronauts into space and on the longer term to have a permanent presence in LEO. This would be a massive 30-year project, with the endgame actually being the Chinese space station that is being assembled at this very moment and scheduled for completion in 2022. Naturally, one of the first key pieces of the crewed spaceflight puzzle that China was trying to solve was to build a human-rated rocket able to send Chinese astronauts safely to low Earth orbit. And this rocket would be the Long March 2F. The Long March 2F is derived from the Long March 2E, and to a large extent, these rockets are very similar. Both rockets have their core stages with a diameter of 3.35 meters, which is a standard size in China for logistical reasons since rocket parts are sent to launch sites by train, and 3.35 meters is the largest that you can fit through the various tunnels of China's railway network. Also worth noting, both rockets have four strap-on boosters with a smaller diameter of 2.25 meters. Now let's have a look at the actual rocket engines. The core stage is composed of four YF-20B engines, while the boosters are composed of a single YF-20B engine each. These are old and mature engines burning an extremely toxic hypergolic mix of UDMH and nitrogen tetroxide, already used successfully on past Long March 2 rockets. They are pump-fed engines, meaning that there is a turbo pump that pumps the propellants from the tanks into the combustion chamber. And more specifically, the engine uses something called a gas generator cycle, and this is something that you can see easily on many launch pictures due to the differently colored exhaust flames coming out of the pre-burner exhaust. With all this propulsive power, the Long March 2F is able to put 8.4 tons into low Earth orbit, which is just about enough to carry the Shenzhou crewed spacecraft that weighs roughly 8 tons. The second stage is composed of a single YF-24 engine, which is actually a combination of a YF-22 main engine and a YF-23 vernier engine. Now let's explain that a little bit. The YF-22 is basically a YF-20 engine on the first stage, but that is vacuum optimized. And what this means is since the YF-22 is a second stage engine, it's fired at high altitudes where the atmospheric pressure is very low. And so the exhaust nozzles are made to be much longer in order to increase the expansion of the flow, lower the pressure of the exhaust gas, and this maximizes the efficiency of the engine. The YF-23 on the other hand is a vernier engine, which means that it is used for attitude control. It is composed of four separate combustion chambers and nozzles, which you can tilt sideways to induce a rotational motion to your rocket. And finally, let's look at the interstage between the first and second stages. After liftoff at roughly 160 seconds into the launch, the Long March 2F performs something called hot separation, where the second stage engine ignites while the second stage is still attached to the first stage. And the first stage actually is only released or jettisoned a short moment later. This is why you have a number of vent holes in the interstage, which enable the evacuation of the flames and the heat when the second stage is ignited. Fun fact though, when you look at the pictures of the Long March 2F on a launch pad, you don't necessarily see these vent holes because they are hidden behind a layer of disposable thermal tiles, which are there to maintain the temperature of the engines on the launch pad. But during the early stages of liftoff, the thermal tiles fall off, revealing these interstage vent holes. So that's it for a quick overview of the common features between the Long March 2E and 2F. Now let's get into the differences. The Long March 2F is 58.4 meters tall, while the Long March 2E is smaller at 49.7 meters tall. The reason for this difference is because the Long March 2F does not have a perigee kick motor of the Long March 2E, which is used to send payloads into GTO. But more importantly, it's because the Long March 2F has a massive launch escape system at the top, which is the pointy thing that you can see on the picture that gives the rocket the additional height. 
And this launch escape system makes the Long March 2F recognizable among a thousand rockets. This is typically something that you can also see on a Russian Soyuz, on the past US Apollo missions, or on the upcoming SLS. The launch escape system can be activated between 15 minutes before the liftoff, meaning that it can be activated while the rocket is still on the launch pad, all the way up to 120 seconds into the launch, basically when the rocket is below an altitude of 40 kilometers. The tower is equipped with a solid fuel engine, which will ignite in case of any malfunction with the rocket, pulling the crewed spacecraft along with the fairings to safety. After 120 seconds into the launch, the escape tower then separates using some secondary separation engines, also solid fueled, which are situated in front of the main escape engines. If the astronauts need to escape after this point of the launch, it's still possible because there are four high altitude escape motors which are situated on the fairing and which can be used. Next, after roughly 210 seconds into the launch, the fairings are then jettisoned. And if some issue comes up after this phase, the rocket's second stage now has reached a sufficient altitude where the Shenzhou can just separate from the second stage to enable the Taikonauts to escape and return to Earth. Continuing my list of differences between the Long Launch 2E and 2F, there are some additional non-visible ones that are definitely worth mentioning. The Long March 2F has had an enhanced fault detection system added, which would notably be able to trigger the launch escape system if necessary. There were also new cameras that were installed to monitor stage and booster separation, and an enhanced telemetry system was also added to be able to downlink images to ground control during the separation process. This is why you can see some very nice images during the live stream of Long March 2F, something that you cannot see during the launches of other Long March 2 rockets. Now let's take a step back and put the Long March 2F into some perspective here. The Long March 2F today is one of the older Chinese rockets still in service. After the kickoff of Project 921 in 1992 and seven years of development, the Chinese launched a first prototype of the rocket in 1999, carrying a Shenzhou spacecraft prototype. After three further test launches, the moment of truth was in 2003 with the fifth launch when it launched for the first time a Chinese astronaut, Yang Li Wei. This was a stressful attempt for the Chinese as this was the third independent crewed launch attempt in history after the US and Russia, the world was watching, and the launch was taking place a couple of months after the Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy where NASA had lost seven astronauts. In the end, the launch was a success, marking China's entry into the very small club of countries that have succeeded in launching astronauts independently. Now, having said that, I think it's worth mentioning that even if the first crewed launch in 2003 was successful, we now know in retrospective that the rocket still had some issues back at the time, of which further incremental iterations got rid of. One of the known ones was the strong vibrations during the launch that can likely be traced back to similar vibrations that the Long March 2E also had and that had caused failures in the 1990s. And while these were dampened for the Long March 2F, Yang Li Wei mentioned that these were still almost unbearable during his flight. Another issue that Yang Li Wei mentioned was that he had noticed the Shenzhou return capsule window cracking during the re-entry phase, a phase where the spacecraft is exposed to extreme heating at hypersonic speeds. But overall today, the Long March 2F is now a mature and extremely safe rocket with so far a perfect track record from the Shenzhou 5 all the way to the latest Shenzhou 13, and it will likely remain China's reference crewed launch vehicle in the future as long as the Shenzhou spacecraft is used to launch Taikonauts into space. And because of this, it may stay in service for quite a few more years. And this could be an exception because all the other Long March 2, 3, 4 series could be progressively phased out since they now have equivalents among the newer generation Long March 6, 7, and 8. It's worth noting, however, that in the future, the Long March 2F will need to coexist with a second, much larger human rated rocket. China is indeed currently developing a new crewed spacecraft, temporarily named the NGCS, which stands for the Next Generation Crewed Spacecraft, or Xin Yidai Zairen Feichuan. And this is sort of an equivalent of NASA's Orion spacecraft. It can carry seven astronauts as opposed to three for Shenzhou, and it is significantly bigger at 14 to 23 tons of mass, depending on the configuration. 
the NGCS can be used for low Earth orbit, but also for lunar and deep space exploration. And it is way too large and too heavy for the Long March 2F to carry. And so instead, China is currently developing a new generation crewed rocket, temporarily named Long March 5DY or 921 rocket, which will exist in a LEO version and a lunar version, putting 14 and 27 tons into LEO and translunar injection respectively. For more discussion on this rocket, do check out another episode that we did a couple of weeks ago specifically on this topic. In the longer term, China is also developing the Super Heavy Long March 9, which would be a sort of Chinese equivalent to SLS, and which would also be human rated and carry the NGCS, although a lot of facts surrounding the Long March 9 are yet to be officially confirmed. And finally, let's wrap up this episode with a fun fact. Did you know that there was an uncrewed variant of the Long March 2F that existed? This uncrewed version used to launch the Tiangong Experimental Space Stations in 2011 and 2016, and visually it is quite different. The launch escape system naturally has been scrapped because there are no Taikonauts, and the rocket uses a larger fairing to accommodate the larger payloads. And finally, fun fact within the fun fact, this rocket was also used to launch and test a mysterious second stage space plane in 2020, as China remains a strong believer in space plane technology, despite SpaceX making vertical takeoff, vertical landing increasingly look like the go-to method for reusability. But that is another story for another episode. As always, a special thanks to our most recent patrons, Chinese Hemp and Hua Tuo, who have supported the channel at buymeacoffee.com slash dongfanghour. Also, a special thanks to one of the Dongfang Hour supporters, Renga Fei, who happily volunteered to help research this episode. Also, do check out our newsletter at newsletter.dongfanghour.com. Blaine does an excellent job of compiling an in-depth weekly China Space News review. And with that, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next episode.